hope that some of that applause was for the virtuoso introduction that Laura wrote for me. And thank you so much for being here with me tonight in this special place that has had so many distinguished Americans speak. Um, when I arrived here this evening, um, something almost biblical was going on outside. <laughs> and I was a little taken aback because that usually only happens when I'm going to speak about Catholicism. <laughs> But tonight I'd like to begin with short sketches of three girls whom I know very well. The first girl had parents who came to the United States from Italy. They were strict and they were certain about certain things and so the girl was too. She knew that if there was money for college, which there wasn't, but if there was, it would go to her brother, even though her art teacher said that she was talented and should go to art school. But her parents expected her to get married, which is what she did, and to have children, which is what she did, five in all, and to never work outside of her home. But sometimes she showed those children a portfolio she kept in her bedroom bureau drawer of her watercolors. And sometimes when she sent them to school on Fridays, she sent them to school with hard boiled eggs on which she'd painted pictures. If she had other dreams, bigger dreams, she never talked about them and neither did any of the other women she knew. The second girl is her daughter. She was raised as her father's oldest son. And when she got B's, he told her they should be A's. And when she got A's, he said they should be A pluses. She always knew that she would go to college, but she also knew that there were lots of colleges that she couldn't think of attending because they were only for men, Princeton and Yale and West Point. She looked around her at the people who ran the country, and they were men, all of them. No matter what dream she had, she was told that it was going to be harder for her because she was female. But she decided that to show them she would just be so much better than the boys that no one would be able to take her less seriously. The third girl is her daughter. She's 19 years old and she has grown up in a completely different world than her mother did. She takes for granted that women work at home and out in the world and that they run things. It would never occur to her that her brothers are more entitled than she to do anything from college to a career in law or medicine or politics or arts and letters. Well, what you've just heard is a family tree. The frustrated artist was my mother. The girl who was pushed hard by her father was me. And that 19-year-old is my daughter. I remember picking her up after she spent Take Our Daughters to Work Day when she was 11 with my friend Kimba, the federal judge, and for some reason saying to her in the taxi, Maria, do you ever think that you might want to be a boy? And without missing a beat, she said, oh no, mama, it would be too boring. <laughs> Those three women all by themselves in their stories show that the status of women in this country has changed radically in just three generations and changed this country as well. We've all witnessed and lived through the greatest societal change in this country in its history. And I make that sweeping generalization without hesitation because as someone who was born before the revolution, educated as it was at the beginning, and ultimately uplifted in every way by its successes, I feel like I've been able to see it whole. In two generations, we've moved from a population of women who were far less educated and represented in the workforce than men to a workforce that is half female and a college population that improbably by the year 2012 will probably be about 60% women. We went from no women in the Senate when I was growing up to 14 women in the Senate today. Last year I spoke at a conference of the senior women executives at the Xerox Corporation. That conference began 20 years ago with 17 women. 
The gathering I spoke to had 400, and they were addressed by the CEO of Xerox, whose name happens to be Anne Mulcahy. A scant 33 years ago, a lawyer by the name of Ruth Bader Ginsburg had to argue before the Supreme Court that a ban on teachers working past their fifth month of pregnancy because of assumed impairment <laughs> and really a concern about the sensibilities of students who might suspect that their teacher had actually had sex <laughs> was constitutionally impermissible. And in other courts all over the country, lawyers argued that women were capable of being firefighters, police officers, even sanitation workers. More important, the federal government guaranteed that sports programs for female athletes would have to be taken serious, as seriously as those for male athletes via Title IX. And the end result is that I am the mother of a daughter who has grown up with precious little evidence that women cannot and do not hold any job open to their male counterparts. She's met two female astronauts, a female general, and a first lady who became a senator and now seeks the presidency. She has never had a male doctor. In fact, one day years ago before she was born, I was driving her brothers home from a visit to their pediatrician, who's one of my closest friends, and Christopher said to Quinn, I might want to be a doctor when I grow up. And Quinn replied, don't be stupid, Christopher, only girls can be doctors. <laughs> Now, why do I return to the personal in this way? It's because the truth is we know the world the way we see it. As a child, I saw no women in positions of real power and authority. Perhaps as important, I saw no women who worked for pay. The money the women I knew had was given to them by men. The position they held was given to them by men, and believe me, for a young girl who was outspoken, intelligent, implicitly insurrectionary, and always faintly ticked off, <laughs> that was a powerful goad to think that the world needed changing. But that's not the world the girls I know, the girl I love, see today. They turn on the television and there's Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. They watch a space launch and Eileen Collins is running it, and they go to Princeton, and Shirley Tillman's running Princeton. And that's progress, that's real progress. It's also a problem. I mean, where does the social movement go when it has been hugely successful, but not ultimately transformative? It's a really interesting question, and I think we're living the answer on all kinds of important fronts. For example, it's easier to sell the necessity of a labor union movement when young women sewing in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory die because a fire breaks out and the windows are barred than when people on automobile assembly lines are making an hourly wage three or four times higher than the government mandate. It's easier to argue against racial prejudice when drinking fountains are designated black and white, and a young black man who whistles at a white woman can be murdered with impunity, than it is when the question is how many black kids are going to get into Harvard, and whether the black son of a doctor is given a leg up over the white son of a cop. And it's far easier to argue for the systematic devaluing of women in society if women are denied the right to own property, to take the bar exam, and to say no to their husbands than it is when women appear to all intents and purposes to be participants in virtually every walk of life. When prejudice and bigotry and injustice are entrenched, egregious, and sanctioned, both overtly and covertly, I think of that as requiring big muscle group remedies. The lawsuit, the amendments, the marches. But the changes in the lives of women now place the women's movement more often in the small muscle group area. 
And that's a place where the intimacy of the revolution becomes the nexus of the next stage of change, which means that in some ways it's really the most difficult part of the whole deal. Because it seems to me that the stage of the women's movement that comes next takes place not so much out in the world, but at home, in changing the hearts and minds of men on deeply personal rather than political levels. Because as long as a revolution transforms the world for only half the population, it can't really call itself a revolution at all. Most representative of this for me is the fact that when I speak like this in public, I am almost always asked by some young woman how it's possible to combine work and family. But in all these years, I've never been asked that question by a man, not once because young men still think they're gonna combine work and family by getting married. <laughs> and that speaks to the fact that the battle that hasn't been won isn't the recognition of the need for equity by corporations or judges. It's the fairness principle absorbed into the fabric of daily life for both men and women. That's a far harder sell and it's a harder sell on an individual level as well, to come home night after night and wave the flag over a colicky baby or a stack of dirty dishes. As the nurse said to me in the hospital when I had to fight to have my legal name on my kid's birth certificate because it was different from my husband's, honey, this is where most of you girls fold. <laughs> and it is. Arlie Hochschild wrote a book several years ago called The Second Shift in which she interviewed couples in which both worked for pay outside the home and found out that the women did 92% of the household chores. That's every bit as lopsided a figure as the old quotas were 30 years ago for women at Harvard Law School. Now, I hear this complaint all the time about young women in America. They don't get it. They don't understand how hard we've worked to get here. They don't understand how bad things were. They don't remember that there was a time when no matter where you went to college or how well you'd done there, the first question you got asked at a job interview was, can you type? But how in the world do we expect them to feel the utterly changed tenor of the times any more than I could truly feel what it was like for my grandparents to raise nine children during the Depression? Of course I know the history, and of course I heard the stories. But at some level, personal experience is a trump card. The young women of today won't hit the glass ceiling where their predecessors have. They're not going to know what it's like to watch as their fathers and husbands go out to vote for president while they stay home. They don't know what it's like to be denied entry to West Point or law school. Virtually all the firsts are gone now, except for the first female president and the first female pope. <laughs> going to hit the glass ceiling at home when almost overnight their carefully ordered world implodes, when they're transformed from a junior executive with a world in a palm pilot to a homebound mother with two kids under the age of three and oatmeal in her hair. She's going to hit it when she realizes that she has somehow wound up with two full-time jobs and her male counterpart is not because of unfinished business about the division of those jobs formally denoted women's work. Because of different choices, different paths, different decisions on the parts of men and women. I suppose I've thought a lot about those differences because I've lived a life shaped by them. Over the desk in my home office, there's a photograph by a photographer named Joyce Rabbit of an easel standing in one corner of what looks to be a hotel corridor. And on the easel is a placard that reads, the key to success, follow your heart. Joyce gave it to me in 1995 at the end of what in many ways was the best job 
at least professional job I'd ever had. For five years, I was an op-ed page columnist for the New York Times, which is probably the best job in journalism. And I was also the only woman in that job, and so rumors were always flying that when I stopped writing, I would go on to help lead the paper for which I worked for almost 20 years. But the truth was that I was leading this weird triple life that any reasonable person would think was in opposition to that kind of future. Because while a lot of every week was spent in reporting and writing on the big issues of the day, on healthcare, gay rights, abortion, the political circus, God, that was all those years ago and there's still the same issues. I can't. <laughs> Some of each week was spent creating a world out of whole cloth, writing novels, publishing two during those five years. And while both of those jobs were extraordinarily time consuming and mentally draining, my most difficult job took place not at the computer but in the kitchen where I was the more or less full-time mother of three young kids. If that sounds hectic, it's because it was. Maybe the best illustration of how wacky our house could be in those years was the evening that our second son, Christopher, came downstairs and said, some man just called on your office phone, but I told him you couldn't talk because you were making dinner. That man was Jesse Jackson. <laughs> he just returned from a fact-finding trip to Haiti. He wanted to fill me in, and he was incredibly cool about being dissed by an eight-year-old boy. <laughs> now, if that happened in a sitcom, you'd just cue the laugh track, but that was my real life. So it happened that one day I was walking down a country road after having finished the first draft of a novel called One True Thing, when I suddenly thought that what I would like to do was to write fiction full time. And over time I decided, as my photograph says, to follow my heart, to trade in the opinion column and take a chance on a different sort of writing life. First I told my friend, the publisher of the New York Times, who was quite disappointed, and then we told the rest of the world who all went crazy. I'm not talking about the genuine regret many readers expressed about the end of our public conversations twice a week. That was very gratifying. But that regret was overshadowed by a great palpable incredulity. The sense that doing what you want is a bizarre and suspect course of action. I'm still not sure I can explain how virulent that was. Is it the lingering Puritan ethic in America that says that real work has to be hard? Is it an investment in being a household name that says that a private life is always less attractive? Of course, for lots of us, the question of doing what we want is hemmed in by one obvious thing, money the tuition payments, the car payments, the house payments. But the stories in the opinion columns that charted my decision didn't talk about the book contract or the working husband that made my change of course financially feasible. Most of them focused on what my decision said about women. And everyone seemed to agree that one woman could be made to stand for all women and that my decision said something monumental about feminism and the changes over the last 25 or 30 years. Well, the more I thought about it, the more I thought maybe that was true. The fallout spoke in part to how little some things had changed. Part of it had to do with the fact that I was the only woman on that page. If there had been two or three other women columnists, as there should have been and still should be by any statistical demographic measure, there wouldn't have been half the fuss. But like a lot of other great American institutions, the New York Times had gotten caught up in the one fur approach. We have a woman, therefore we have women. I mean, it was best summed up for me when I was at a convention and I met an editor who ran the New York Times syndicate. And he said to me, gosh, our paper would love to run your column, but we already run Ellen Goodman. 
Why did I know Bill Sapphire never heard that about George Will? <laughs> and while our Times story about my decision was headlined correctly, Quinlan leaving Times to be full-time novelist, most of the other stories suggested that I wanted to spend more time with my family. Ignoring the fact that I had worked at home and around my children's school schedules during all my time as a columnist, and that at that point, if I spent one more minute with them, I was locking them all out in the backyard. <laughs> it was clear that people thought that you would give up such a powerful position only because of an estrogen surge. And, and that it was really my women's character that made this even dimly understandable. Well, maybe it does make it understandable because maybe the truth is that despite all the changes of the last few decades, we women remain better able to make decisions based on the voice that speaks from our heart and not that great they out there that dictates career paths and life goals based on a cookie cutter view of success and a disdain for personal happiness. The reaction to my decision reinforced a sense I've always had that lots of women see life as a circle, but lots of our male counterparts see it as a straight line. So many of the guys I talked to seemed to have an idea of career that was inevitably a ladder, like it or not. Some didn't like it at all. They would quietly confide to me that they too had always wanted to put aside one path and try another, but they just hadn't had, I don't know, the guts, the permission to go ahead with it. Others were just dismissive. One corporate giant told a friend that my decision proved what he'd always known. Women are afraid of success. Well, I am not afraid of success. I just believe that success that looks good on paper but doesn't feel good inside isn't really success at all. And here's another thing I don't believe. I don't believe that this revolution was about we women wanting the right to lead imitations guys' lives, complete with those little floppy tie things we wore in the beginning. <laughs> I mean, what was that all about? I think what we really wanted was a revolution that would change the world for everyone that wasn't just about liberation, but was about transformation. Because transformation in this country at all levels is sorely needed, and we can bring it. I remember some years ago I was giving a speech about health care to some members of Congress and their staffs in Washington, D.C. And one of the things I was talking about was the persistent failure of doctors to see their patients as human beings, their insistence on treating the file and ignoring the patient. And a woman at the front of the room raised her hand and said, the basic problem is with who gets to go to medical school. The guy who aces organic chemistry is not necessarily the guy you want to deal with when you have breast cancer. IQ counts for everything. EQ, what the writer Daniel Goleman called emotional intelligence, EQ counts for almost nothing. It was one of those statements that stayed with me afterwards because it was clearly so deeply true. But it also got me thinking not just about medicine, but about all sorts of professions and about the roles of women in this country and what they can bring to the table. Years ago, the Center for the American Woman in Politics at Rutgers University did a survey that showed that even if you held steady for geographic region and party ideology, women office holders behave completely differently than their male counterparts. They're more likely to hold meetings in an open setting, to ask the opinions of people who aren't part of the usual power structure, to listen to their constituents, and to embrace what were once called women's issues but are now clearly the cutting edge, health care, education, child care. And I remember reading that description and thinking, that wasn't a description of women politicians. That's the description of what people have been telling us they want from their politicians for years. It was a description of the ideal elected official.
That's why a new ethic is in order, not because it's the right thing to do for women, but because the old ethic has been so spectacularly unsuccessful. I mean, most of us would agree that our government has significant shortcomings in all areas, ranging from the economy to defense to social welfare. The ways in which our corporations are run often seem to create maximum compensation for executive positions and minimum connection with the consumer, so that today's booming business is tomorrow's bankrupt. We need the values and skills of all people but perhaps most particularly those who are in a position because of their longtime outsider status to try something other than business as usual. We need some from column A and some from column B. If we take column A to mean traditional male models and column B to mean traditional female ones. Now, so far this doesn't work both ways across gender lines. We know, for example, that there are lots of leadership situations in which bringing people together is necessary, yet somehow male leaders who are not skilled in those areas have managed to prevail. Or to remedy the deficit, I remember once speaking to a group of surgeons about that need to make connections with patients and having one trio of guys in practice together rush up after my speech to inform me that they'd heard me, they got my point, and when they went back home, they were going to hire a woman for their office specifically to deal with patient contact. <laughs> Women in all different kinds of venues have had to be all things to all leaders, all people to be considered real leaders, to be as tough as nails and as warm as toast all at the same time. Woe betide the woman executive who is seen as mannish, Funny that that's seen as a pejorative, or conversely, the one who's seen as a softy. There's still a double standard that's suggested by a New Yorker cartoon, which of course I have on my bulletin board. A king and a queen are sitting side by side, and the queen is complaining, yes, but when a woman beheads someone, they call her a bitch. <laughs> We also need to reach out and offer our male counterparts the gift of choice that we have so recently won. Because one of the things that feminism shows us is not just how far women have come, but how little things have changed on the distaff side of the aisle. And I became particularly sensitive to that as a mother of sons. I was terrified of seeing their technicolor characters crammed into some brown cardboard box of stereotypical masculinity. And I saw that instead of men past who were consigned to only one box, the stiff upper lip button down collar box, my boys, as a function of feminism, had two competing sets of expectations to meet. They were supposed to be tough and tender, aggressive and nurturing. By the time they were born, the having it all syndrome, in which we women were told by the culture that the price of freedom was a frantic existence that included two full-time jobs, had trickled down to our sons so that the messages they were receiving from the world were confusing and contradictory. I think the number line of this whole revolution was drawn a little off. I mean, it was a kind of a classic dialectic. We started with a thesis, the old thesis of woman as wife and mother alone. And then we came up with an antithesis. We all ran over here to the guy side, despite the fact that lots of the guys didn't find the guy side so terribly satisfying. A whole group of us traded home and hearth for money and power. And I think finally we're beginning to reach a synthesis. The recognition that from here and here, the place to come is here, somewhere in the middle. And the knowledge that instead of women living more like men, if men wanted more satisfying lives, they would try to live more like us. 
I want my sons to benefit from the changes of the last 30 years, not by knuckling under to any new, kinder, gentler definition of masculinity, but by feeling free to create their own definition, one by one by one, because that's the only way, isn't it? I mean, some women are very assertive by nature, and some men are deeply nurturing. Some women are natural doctors, and some men natural nurses. Perhaps we've reached a moment when the synthesis can cut across gender lines, and boys can realize that the standard of masculinity is the standard of humanity. Integrity, kindness, curiosity, humor, thoughtfulness. I mean, femininity was once easy to define. It was not masculine. But all that changed when women moved out into new roles in the world because some of the behaviors they needed and that some of them had at their psychological disposal were ones that we had previously defined as masculine. Leadership, ambition, physical strength, mental toughness. That easy definition disappeared, as all easy definitions should. But that left men with an old, easy definition of masculinity, not feminine. But what could that possibly mean in a world that included Margaret Thatcher and Sally Ride, the WNBA and the women's Olympic ice hockey team? What could that mean in a world in which there was some likelihood that their wives would earn more than they did? A likelihood that many of them found curiously reassuring. And had that not feminine definition cheated men out of too much over the years? Had the price of power, or at least certainty, been too high? Had men been required to follow a ladder while women were learning to follow their inclinations? If I believe, as I do, that the hands-on day-to-day rearing of children was the making of me, both as a writer and as a human being, can I bear the thought that my sons may miss out on that because of some narrow and outmoded mandate associated with their gender? Sometimes it seems to me like we're on a plateau here, be calmed by progress. Instead of choice, sometimes it seems we got a new set of set in stone rules. The uber woman who somehow can simultaneously excel in the office and then do perfectly at home. Instead of transformation, materialism. Instead of sexual freedom, joyless promiscuity. Instead of justice for all, privilege for the privileged. And it's not as though sexism has disappeared. Consider the guys who yelled, iron my shirts at a Clinton event in New Hampshire earlier this year. I've been told to lighten up. It was a joke. Would we have been as sanguine about such a joke along racial lines? And there was that moment when someone asked Senator John McCain, how are we going to beat the bitch? McCain may be the father of daughters, but to his shame, he did not protest. Even the prototypical new man, Senator Obama, had his moments accusing Senator Clinton of whining which is what argument is called if you don't have a Y chromosome. <laughs> and saying that she attacked him on issues when she felt down, making opposition sound like shoe shopping. Imagine Obama using any of that language against McCain. You just can't. Attacking this persistent, pernicious nuance isn't victim politics of years past. It's important for the future of this country. There aren't that many wonderful people running for elective office in America. <laughs> and if half the available candidates are held to some unexamined standard in which ambition is considered a pejorative and a loud voice a turn off, that deficit will persist. Those ideal politicians revealed in that Rutgers study will not become politicians at all. We can't let that happen. I mean, the fact is the women's movement didn't do a favor to American women. It did a favor to American society. 
There's no question we're on a little bit of a plateau, and I think there's a sense of frustration and impatience because the revolution of the mind, spirit, and home has often not matched the revolution of the courts, the workplace, and the outside world. Sometimes people say to me now, whatever happened to the women's movement? And I say to them, it is like God everywhere. <laughs> Every time a little girl pitches a ball in Little League. Every time a woman cop gives you a ticket and you're furious, but you barely notice she's a woman. The, what the world can offer her in the way of existence and opportunity are simply radically different for the girl born in 1992 than they were for the girl born in 1942. The women's movement was really a battle against waste the waste of talent, the waste of society, the waste of women who had certain gifts and goals and had to suppress both. The point wasn't to take over male terrain, but to change it because it really needed changing. The depth and breadth of that transformation is what reflects the success of the movement. Fathers do take a larger role today in the daily raising of their kids. Companies do feel more pressure to be sensitive to medical and family issues. Sex crimes are prosecuted now. So is domestic violence. Patients demand more personal care from their doctors. Readers want more human interest stories from magazines. Even the bottom line benefited. Catalyst, the research organization that tracks women at work, has reported that the Fortune 500 corporations with the most women in top positions yielded on average a 35% higher return on equity than those with the fewest female corporate officers. In 1970, 46 women at Newsweek charged it with workplace discrimination. Today, Newsweek publishes an annual issue on women's leadership, which for the last two years has been in the top quarter of newsstand sales. And if those kinds of changes are unremarked by younger women, that's inevitable. They've learned to live with everyday equality, with female astronauts and secretaries of state and mothers who run news broadcasts and museums and even whole countries. As someone who would have been a truly mad housewife in the 50s, I feel blessed to have lived in this time. I only wish we'd gotten started earlier so that my mother could have gone to art school. Thank you very much. Wiggany with the English department, uh, professor of English and a writer, and who is someone who's very comfortable with his masculinity. Thank you very much. <laughs> we will now take questions for Anna Quinlan. What he didn't mention is that I just had to ask him to open the water bottle for me, <laughs> <laughs> thereby obliterating the entire point of my speech. <laughs> questions? Is, are there mics? Yeah, there's a mic right there. Can you pass it over to the woman in the yellow shirt? Um, asking, um, your speech is called Choices. Do you talk about women's choice, the right to choose? The, do you mean the right to choose in general or the right to right. choose to have a legal abortion? Right. I, I mean, I've probably written about the right to legal abortion more than any other um, columnists in the country. Um, I didn't feel the, the need to address it directly tonight, but I'm always happy to, which is um, that 
the two sides of this debate seem to have set up a kind of a false dichotomy in this country, and that is that there, the dichotomy is between legal abortion and no abortion. It behooves us all to remember that that's not the choice. It's a choice between legal abortion and illegal abortion. And we know about many of the ramifications of the latter. One of the most, I was gonna say successful, but that's the wrong word. One, one of the columns I wrote that got the biggest reader reaction was a column I wrote for the New York Times called The Abortion Orphans, in which I interviewed a group of women who grew up without mothers because their mothers had died from illegal abortions when they were small children. And that put the entire issue in a completely different light for many of the people who were reading about it because they understood all of the ramifications of what we would do if we made abortion illegal in this country. Um, I believe that that would be a grave, grave mistake. Um, I don't see that happening, although I think there is some possibility um, that if a conservative Republican was elected president, he could fill the court um, with justices who over the next four to eight years could overturn turn Roe versus Wade, but it behooves us all to remember that if Roe were to be overturned, that would just send this issue back to the states, and then each of us would have to work on the state level to do what we think is right, which in, in my case in New York would be to keep abortion legal and available. That's another thing, we talk so much about this constitutional right, but if no medical students are learning how to to perform the procedure. And if no places are available that offer the procedure, then what does the right mean? The people, the women of Mississippi, for example, have a constitutional right to an abortion, but there's one clinic in the entire state in Jackson, and opponents are doing everything they can um, to shut that down. So what, it, you know, what does it mean if you have a constitutional right but no option to exercise it? Um, this is a very, very complex issue. Um, it's an important moral one. Um, and quite frankly, my bottom line is my pelvis is not public property and no man in Washington can make it so. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, um, you, know, you talk about the revolution over the, uh, this time span, and, and I look at it, it um, not just from your perspective, from a man's perspective, the revolution that men have gone through. And just your comment on, you know, we're at a place in time now where Time is moving very, 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 very fast, and it's getting faster and faster. How do we slow it down where we're in balance, both men and women, where we can enjoy life more instead of always just running all the time? That's a really good question, and actually one of the reasons why I'm so optimistic about the future in America is because of a group of Americans who are called by demographers the millennials. Um, they're the group of people who are in their very late teens and their 20s now. Um, happens that all three of my children fall in that group. But just from knowing them and their friends, I think they are going to be one of the most interesting, productive, transformative generations in the history of this country. They're an incredibly tolerant group of people. They've done more community service and philanthropy than any generation in the history of this country. And one of the things that they clearly have on the front burner for their own lives is some sense of balance. This is how I know this, because in New York, I keep hearing complaints from executives and partners in law firms, and they say, I just interviewed a kid the other day. You know, the thing about these kids is they have no work ethic. <laughs> now, for him, what it means is a kid has no work ethic. What it really means is that the person said they really thought a 70-hour work week was unreasonable. If this is a generation that understands that you can do a good job at your job 
and not be at the office every Saturday and most Sundays, that presence doesn't equal productivity, then I think we will slow everything down and there will be a much better quality of life in this country. And I feel really good about that. journalism school just a few years after you did and my question is we've long heard that journalists don't tell us what to think but they tell us what to think about can you comment on the state of journalism today as it as opposed to the way it was in the early 70s sure I actually never went to journalism school I'm an English literature major um, <laughs> Everything I know about journalism, I learned from Charles Dickens. Um, um, I think that in many ways, um, this is the best time to be well informed in the history of this country. But it requires consumers to do some work. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. When I was growing up, it was possible for us to read two newspapers, the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Bulletin and to watch one of three nightly newscasts on either CBS, NBC, or ABC. That was it. If you missed them, you could get another one 24 hours later. It's like telling younger people, like, like it's like the Iliad. <laughs> Last night I said to a group of students, and then at two o'clock, television would shut down for the night. And they went, what do you mean, shut down? And I said, well, there'd be a, the American flag. <laughs> now, now, almost anywhere in America, you can get the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, as well as your local paper. You can get news any time of the day or night. Some news that's informed by conservative thought, some news that's informed by liberal thought, some news that's informed by Christian thought. You can get the BBC. I, I, I mean, there's so much out there that the sheer, the sheer quantity means that if you pick and choose carefully, you can sort of be your own editor and put together an assemblage of news that will give you a unique opportunity in the span of American history to know what's going on in the world. But you got to do the work that way. You can't just say, and I will just read my local paper, or, and I will just watch Brian Williams for a half an hour on NBC. Consumers of the news now have to be educated consumers. But if they are, given what's available on the internet, on television, and in print, I think that, that the opportunity to know what's going on in the world and to understand how people live in the world, that's the other thing that's so different. I mean, two things I would tell you about the past, which America is the capital of rose-colored glasses. Everything was always better whenever, okay? Take a, take a moment, if you ever get a chance, and go back and read your local newspaper in the 30s on microfilm. They're so boring, it's unbelievable. They're written in this really boring fashion. They take everything that's told to them as gospel, and as far as you can tell from these papers, no one is female or black, <laughs> unless they're getting married, and then they're only female. Um, it, it's sort of astonishing to, to look at these papers and to think that that was sort of how things worked. And the other thing is, we didn't really get a sense of how real people lived in the world. And I think that was particularly important from a foreign point of view. So that one reason why the Cold War lasted so long and was so persistent was because we had developed this sense of, say, the Russians or the Chinese as other, as essentially different from us in important ways. And I think one of the ways journalism has changed over the last 30 years is that given the plethora of stories about the way people live, we understand more about how people in other countries are not the other and it makes it harder to demonize them and from a purely human perspective I think that's all for the good wait wait why is there an 
I don't know if he can toss that up there. Can somebody run a, a, a mic up there? I don't think I need it. <laughs> All right, wait, let her hold on to that mic and we'll take him first and then her. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Would you comment on the following statement? Conservatives follow their emotions. Liberals follow their intellect. As a specific example, conservatives want to ban abortion. Liberals want to reduce the number of abortions by whatever practical means exist. No comment on the specific example, but this is the first comment. Conservatives follow their emotions. Liberals follow their well, as an incredibly emotional liberal, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that I don't think that tracks at all. In fact, I, I thought I almost think it tracks the other way. I mean, you know, a lot of my liberalism is, comes out of a deep well of emotion about the connections between human beings. So for example, one of the reasons that I support government food programs is because I resonate deeply on a personal level to the idea of hungry kids, and I've spent a fair amount of time around them as a reporter. So I, I, don't, I, don't, think, I don't think it can be it can be cut and dry. I know two kinds of people with strong politics. People where their politics are kind of a veneer, a carapace, where you know they'll talk about political issues and, and, and then they can just really easily go out for a beer with somebody whose political views are their polar opposite and kind of appall them. And people for whom their politics is written deep in their DNA. And I think those, that includes people from both the liberal and the conservative wings of both parties. And that happens to be the kind of, the kind of person that I am. I just want to thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your insight with us. I do have a question. As a former member of the press, can you speak to what I view as the very different tones of how um, our Democratic candidates are reported upon? It seems to me there's somewhat of a tone in the press that they're very for one of our candidates, and then the other one, um, it doesn't seem to be getting a fair shake, and I'm wondering if you're seeing the same thing. Well, first of all, I'm not a former member of the press. I'm a current member of the press, and I'll be a member of the press till the day I die. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really proud to be a member of the press. I mean, if not for my peeps, you all would still think that Brownie did a heck of a job with Katrina, you know, so. Um, here's the thing. It's always like, what's the story? You know, and the, the press corps knew Hillary really well, and they didn't know Barack Obama very well at all. So suddenly Barack Obama was the story. And then he was a really interesting story because he was trying to run a different kind of campaign. And then they got really engaged by that different kind of campaign. And then the Clinton seemed really same old. And so then they seemed hostile to Hillary and positive to Obama, except that now what's going to happen is that at some point they're going to say, OK, now we got to tell you the bad stuff about Obama. And that's going it, to, it's always a pendulum of going back and forth, back and forth. And I think that's been particularly fraught this year in some odd kind of way because it's such an interesting race. I mean, the press never gets that lathered up if it's kind of a boring race, which is why you may notice that they're barely covering Senator John McCain, except for me who felt the need to tell you all this week about the fact that he's flip-flopped on virtually every major position in the last 12 months. Because I, it's just making me crazy. <laughs> But that's because th there, there's not snap, crack, on pop. There's a lot of snap, crack, on pop on the Democratic side, and 
it's really a challenge to keep it in balance. And that's why I say that you got to shop around for news sources, you know? I mean, if, if you only watched MSNBC, you would be surprised that Hillary is still taking solid food by mouth, <laughs> you know? So, so you got to... And the BBC, the BBC makes a nice change from all of this, and they do a really good job of covering the war in Iraq, um, and did early on when, when uh, I, I'm afraid that we were, we were not quite as on top of our game as we needed to be in the press corps. So th that's why I say that you have to shop around. Uh, have they been hard on Senator Clinton? I think sometimes there was a certain edge. I mean, in the beginning, it was because she was a front runner. Then it was because she makes people crazy in ways that I've never really understood because I've had the advantage or the disadvantage, depending on how you put it, of knowing her for a long time. But I definitely think that there's been some teeter-totter, and it will continue, and then it will start up again in the general election. And you all just be really careful about reading stuff at a bunch of different sources. And when you hear that somebody said something stridently, watching the clip yourself so you can judge for yourself whether it's strident or just surely, which is a completely different thing. Uh, one more? One more. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm puzzled and curious and distressed about one aspect of women who and work outside the home. Um, when I grew up, women basically did not work outside the home. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't because of the way society and the economy was structured. And now, in the last 20 or 30 years, I find I have friends who would like not to work outside the home or work only part-time for a variety of reasons. They have young children, they have teenagers, and one person who had teenagers said, this is the time I really need to be at home. And, or they have aging parents or ill relatives, and they don't have that choice because it takes in our economy today two full-time jobs, sometimes more, just to pay the mortgage, just to make basic living expenses. So I don't see that women still have the choices that we would like to have. Well, I actually think that, that there are people who don't have choice about, as I said, you know, follow, uh, you can follow your heart as long as your mortgage isn't too big. Um, but I do think that there are a fair number of people who have more of a choice than they like to think about how they're going to spend their work life. It's just that sometimes we set the bar really high for ourselves. We set the bar really high for ourselves in terms of, you know, how great the great room's going to be, um, or you know, how how big the SUV is going to be, or that kind of thing, and that. I wish that these times of economic peril would lead us as Americans to take the long view because it seems like we only deal with them in a scattershot approach and then when happy days are here again, we go right back to massive credit card debt and a car that's as big as a orca whale. Um, and, and one of the th parts of that, I think, is to decide what's really important in the long haul. I mean, you know, I do like to quote Senator Paul Songus when he wrote to a friend when he discovered he had cancer, no man ever said on his deathbed, I wish I had spent more time at the office. And I think within the boundaries of what we can and should do, not only for our families, but for ourselves, um, sometimes we get locked into one way of thinking about our lives that if someone told us we only had a year to live, we would change utterly. And I think that if we would and we could find a way to change it utterly, if we were given a death sentence, we ought to think about changing it utterly if we're given a life sentence. Thank you all very much.